joining us. Our webinar today is going to be 30 minutes along with time at the end for Q&A. During the webinar, you can send your questions through the chat window and we will answer your questions during the Q&A portion at the end of our time today. We will be issuing PDH certificates for those attending the live session that have elected to receive them and we'll be sending those out within the next 24 hours. We do encourage you to visit our website, BartlettWest.com, and click on the Webinars tab to see upcoming webinars as well as to register. All of our webinars will be available on demand after the live session. So if you were unable to attend or a colleague of yours, um, you would like to pass this information along to them, you can check it out on our website after the event today. Today we will hear from Sharisha Chada, who is a Senior Project Manager at Bartlett and West. With 15 years of experience, she provides expertise in structuring and managing renewable gas projects related to waste to energy conversion facilities. Sharisha also serves on the Sustainability and Finance Technology Advisory Committees for the Renewable Gas Natural Gas Coalition. Today, she'll be discussing cow power, renewable fuel from manure. With that, I'm going to turn it over for Sharisha to take it away. Hello, good morning, everybody. I hope everyone is staying safe out there. And I'm really glad you're able to join our webinar this morning. So what do you think you call a cow that doesn't give any milk? It is a milk dad. During the course of this webinar today, I'm going to be covering various topics, including the financial drivers, um, environmental and regulatory drivers for these projects. We will also be looking at project fundamentals. What does it take to get these projects from start to finish? We will look at how this RNG is transmitted and um, how it is stored on site, as well as roadblocks and how they can be overcome. So what is RNG? RNG is nothing but renewable natural gas. We're all familiar with natural gas. Natural gas is formed uh, from organics that are buried in the Earth's crust over thousands of years. Uh, renewable natural gas is created from organic waste by expediting nature's processes using technology to create a clean fuel. There can be several sources of these organics, including landfill, food waste, agricultural waste, and wastewater sludge. And the renewable natural gas can be used to replace wherever fossil fuel is used, including providing heating and electricity for homes and in manufacturing as well as it can be converted to compressed natural gas and used in transportation of vehicles. So before we uh, talk through the process, I wanted to understand and hear from you as to how many dairy RNG projects do you think are there in the US? Okay. Okay. I see people are changing their answers. Okay, we'll find out the answer to this question uh, in the next slide. But so how do we make renewable natural gas starting from cow manure? So we have the manure, which is digested in an anaerobic digester using microorganisms. These organisms use the manure as food and produce uh, byproducts. And one of the byproducts is biogas. The biogas is can be considered as dirty fuel. It has about 60% methane and other impurities. In order for us to make biogas into renewable natural gas, you, it needs to go through an upgrading process involving several unit operations to make renewable natural gas, which is up, about 98% methane. 
And this renewable natural gas is then supplied via pipeline and can be used as transportation fuel. Here I have a map of the dairy farm landscape in the US, uh, the RNG projects that are there in US right now. There are a total of 8,300 farms in US, of which only 205 are dairy digesters. They have dairy digesters in place right now. And we have about 23 um, dairy farm to RNG projects and out of which nine of them are operational. Bartlett is, and West is part of four of these projects and we have two of them operational in Wisconsin. So let's take a look at what are the various project drivers. The regulatory drivers are a major force that are driving these dairy RNG projects forward, whether it is the federal renewable fuel standard or the state-driven ones like the low carbon fuel standard from California. Both of these programs require that the transportation fuel uh, producers or the refineries, they purchase uh, renewable fuels and use them in their portfolios. Uh, prior to RFS, biogas was generally used as a fuel on site or for heating or producing steam or in a CHP system. And with the advent of the renewable fuel standard, things have changed drastically. So what is RFS? RFS is the renewable fuel standard. It was passed in 2005 and the main goal of the standard is to uh, include a certain volume of renewable fuel in, in the fuel mix. This was further expanded in 2007 to increase the amount of renewable fuel to 20%. As you can see in this chart, there is a set target that they're trying to reach by 2022, which is 36 billion gallons. This is only a target. So the aim main objective is to reduce the amount of greenhouse gas emissions and also expand the amount of renewable fuel produced. Each of the refineries that produces fuel is given a set target, that is the renewable volume obligation that, have, that they have to meet every year. This target is set by EPA in the year before. And according to the RFS, all these renewable fuels are categorized into various uh, different categories based on the substrate they're using to make the fuel. This is the called the D-code, and our dairy farms have uh, come under the D3 category. As you can see, various D-codes have different reduction targets, and there is a the RFS provides a fuel nesting scheme so that if you're able to meet the requirements in the D3 category, then you would have met the requirements for D6 as well. So what are RINs? Uh, RINs are, I mean, you hear about this RINs and RIN credits very often during the project. RINs are nothing but a ticket for uh, uh, identification or an identification number that is tied to each gallon of, of RNG or the gallons equivalent of RNG that is produced. They are a tool that is used for proving con compliance by the uh, obligated parties. The number of RINs that are generated per million um, British thermal units is about 11.7. Each refinery is required to blend a certain amount of uh, renewable fuel in based on their production capacity. And when they do that, they get a certain amount of RINs. When this RNG is blended into the pipeline, these RINs are separated and they can be turned over to the EPA to prove compliance. So what happens is sometimes the refiners blend more than what they are required to, and then they can keep these excess RINs for up to two years. Also, some of the blenders who don't have any requirements can also use uh, renewable fuel, and then they can get additional RINs. Now, these are the RINs that are excess RINs that are available and are freely traded in the market to other parties who need to meet their renewable volume obligations. 
So different states are also following suit and they are uh, trying to implement their own policies. And one of the leaders is California with the, its a low carbon fuel standard. The low carbon fuel standard compensates for the amount of CO2 reduction uh, when compared to fossil fuels. And note that the RFS and LCFS are additive in nature. So that means the more credits, if you can prove a pathway to uh, California that you can take credit for that excess credits. The California standard, they have set some aggressive standards of reducing the amount of uh, fossil fuel used by 50% in the vehicles. So the, typically the LCFS gives a pathway, uh, talks about the pathway from the fuel's life cycle from well to the final pump. And it also talks about the carbon intensity score. And this is a value that is calculated by, uh, that is calculated by compiling all the different carbon that is emitted along the supply chain of the fuel. And as you can see from this chart, the lower the carbon intensity score, the better. That means it is a net negative in carbon emissions. And proving a pathway to uh, California can dramatically improve the value and viability of your project. Why, uh, why is it important for us to understand RFS and LCFS? Because with the additional revenue that is generated from RFS and LCFS, there, it increases the value of the gas. I just use this to calculate how much more value the gas is. As you can see, the commodity price of the gas is only a small fraction of the percentage if you're able to generate these uh, RIN credits and LCFS credits. And eco engineers um, typically sends a daily value of these RIN credits and LCFS credits. So using that, uh, I calculated the value of gas and um, the LCFS credits, as you see, are a major portion of the source of revenue. So what are the other, sorry, what are the other financial drivers? As we see, uh, there are about 8,300 farms. So there is a significant market potential for these projects. The technology that they use is proven technology, the anaerobic digesters or the gas upgrading systems. It's proven technology, so it's low risk. The feedstock is renewable and uh, there's a surplus availability of the feedstock. The stakeholders, whether it's the developers or the farmers, they're interested in these projects and they have adequate policy support in the form of RFS and LCFS. Also, most of these projects are located in uh, rural areas where the, there is a potential for creation of jobs as well as um, the payback period on these projects is very attractive because most of these projects have a pay payback period of less than three years. On the environmental side, we are converting waste to make fuel and other productive resources. So that's a definite win-win. And every time we are using a gallon of uh, renewable fuel, that means we are using that much less fossil fuel. And if we weren't going to do these RNG projects from the dairy, the manure would just be treated as waste and the methane that would be emitted would um, deplete the ozone layer 23 times faster than that of carbon dioxide. So we are uh, improving that situation by capturing the methane. Also treating the manure in the anaerobic digester helps with uh, redu reducing the pathogens that are there in the liquid and solid residues. So you are able to get a better quality of soil and water. The solid and liquid res residues can be further processed and uh, repurposed as different products. And by doing this, you're being a good neighbor and reducing the amount of waste that's entering your waterways. So how do we get these projects from concept to startup? Let's think about this. If 
when you take a broad overview of the project, you have to think about how, what kind of business model are you going to use for this project? Are you going to own the equipment? How are you going to operate this? Is it going to be like a hub and spoke model where you have several different dairy farms and all of them are feeding to a central digester and an upgrading facility? How is this project going to be financed? Um, it, is it going to be completely financed by an owner or is it going to be debt financing? Or are, are we going to be able to take off some of the grants available for agricultural pro uh, projects? What are the different sources of revenue? As we saw previously, there are there's a source of revenue in terms of commodity sales, then there's monetization of the environmental attributes in terms of rent credits and LCFS credits. The digest state can be sold. Also, are there any carbon offset credits that you can get? And at this point of time, it's important to also think about budgeting for various activities, even though it might be a little hard uh, because Sometimes projects think they can be done too efficiently and that's not always the case. You're scram left scrambling for money in the end. So the discrepancy also is like most of those projects look very good on paper, but they are never able to take off because you need a really good team to do that. And what do we have to consider when we are looking at the team you have in order to get these projects up and running, you're dealing with a number of different kinds of uh, skill sets in terms of the team. You have the developer, you have the financier, you have the farmer, you have an EPC company, a compliance or regulatory specialist, an offtake partner. So make sure you pick the right team, make sure you understand the team's core competencies and understand what each one's limitations are, what you can do and what you cannot do, but you need to get done and how are you going to get done? Uh, it's, it's known that if you pick somebody with experience, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. Also make sure that everybody on the team is on the same page. Is the financial somebody who has experience with these projects or are they entering a new territory? Make sure that they understand that the RIN and LCFS values are not constants and they are variables. If we were to do a checklist of what are the important things that we need to consider during the course of the project, we would have to do a feasibility study. Think about the biogas yield, what are the feedstock agreements, offtake agreements, permits, what kind of technology are we going to use to get this project done? Who's going to be the contractor? And what's the plan for operating this plant once it's up and running? And how are we going to get the gas to the end user? Here, um, so the first step is to get a feasibility study done. You know there is a good project out there and you feel comfortable, but don't think that you'll be saving some money by not doing this feasibility study, I say that a penny spent now will save you a dollar later. It's important to understand what kind of uh, feedstock you're dealing with and get an estimate of the capital and operating costs, understand the biogas yield, what's going to be your uptime and what's the cash flow look like and what's the payback period. So hire an exp expert at this and uh, get an independent opinion for all your assumptions. Here I've attached a sample performer from a Bartlett and West, um, taking into consideration a sample amount of gas and with 65% methane, how far is the nearest pipeline and what's the uh, maximum allowable operating pressure of this pipeline. Why is biogas yield important? Because the feedstock can vary the biogas yield uh, 
the feedstock can vary the biogas yield uh, a lot. So it's important to understand what kind of feedstock you're dealing with. If you don't have a digester in place, then you should get uh, analysis, laboratory analysis done to understand the biomethane potential of this feedstock. Um, even if you have a digester in place, most of the times it is noticed that the biogas is treated as a waste product or a byproduct and not really seen as a resource. So there might not be any sort of a drive to optimize and it might not have had a good sampling done. Sometimes the sites do have sampling data on the hydrogen sulfide content because the composition, uh, it is required for air permitting. The, also, it is important to understand that the biogas composition varies greatly with the digester or the lagoon performance. And historical data is key to understanding what you have and basing your assumptions on that. I see that there were some questions floating around. I've, I'm going to answer the questions at the end of the webinar. So let's look at uh, the, uh, the main thing that is the feedstock agreement. Uh, you need to have your feedstock agreement, understand what kind of uh, availability is there. Because the, if you have a consistency in the quality of the feedstock, that would greatly help your digester operations to maintain the productivity of the microbial community, those little bugs. Um, it's important to feed them with the same kind of feedstock. Also, this will result in consistent organic destruction and uh, produce biogas and minimize any sort of operational issues. So understand the quantity and the quality. Also, if, if you need to do any sort of co-digestion, please ensure that you know what kind of feedstock characteristics are there for the co-digested product so, so that you know and understand your digester operations. Um, another important thing in getting these feedstock agreements done is to build trust with the farmer. It's essential. I mean, for you, you might think that this project is getting so much revenues doing it's such a value added project, but the farmer, for them, it might be a small percentage of their revenue stream, and it might be like only a small bonus. And also know that the cow is king, and you will be a guest on their side. So, once you know that you're going to be making this product, also ensure that you have the offtake agreements in place. It is important. It's good if you get a head start on that and choose a right offtake partner who's able to monetize these RIN and LCFS credits. Because the pipeline interconnection, don't assume that you will, it will be easy and the local pipeline operator is going to work very well with you. Get a head start on that. Understand what are the quality requirements of the gas that they, they are going to accept. What's the pressure requirements? How are you going to handle the O&M costs for the interconnection? What is going to be the transmission cost? And is this service going to be interruptible? And what, what happens when there is uh, out of spec gas? Is there a flare available over there? And what sort of maintenance procedures need to be followed? So here I have a sample of the requirements, the pipeline tariff from mid-American company. As you can see, the BTU content. And this is very important because the requirements for the pipeline are different in different states. And it's important to understand that the fossil fuel, the natural gas that's coming from fossil fuel, it has a higher BTU content because it also includes butane, ethane, etc. But the renewable natural gas that you make from organic waste is pure. And so the calorific value is lower. Permitting. This is another important, very important thing that needs to be considered right from the get-go. 
because you're investing millions and millions of dollars in these projects and it is and the permitting varies from state to state um, you have to determine all the requirements from the beginning and understand uh, what ki what kind of permits are required if you're starting from the anaerobic digester it might be different than if you're starting only with the upgrading facility the agencies can still come back and ask some questions or they can ask more information. So make sure you build enough time in your schedule for the permitting because that might put, if you if you have a too aggressive a schedule and if you don't accommodate for the permitting, that might uh, set you back greatly. Um, air permitting is one of the important things. Uh, typically, if there was biogas already being made, at this facility, they might have some sort of an air permit and then it would only mean um, modifications to the existing air permit. If it's a new source, it is different. Make sure that uh, in some cases, you might be exceeding the levels and you might have to go into a Title V kind of requirement and that might take longer times. So understand the needs and develop a plan for that Having a regulatory consultant from before is going to be useful in meeting these requirements um, and ensure that you'll be able to comply with the regulations on an ongoing basis. Uh, if you're disposing of the solid waste, you might also need to look into RECRA. So understand those needs in terms of permitting. The EPC contractor. So choosing your EPC contractor is critical in getting the project to succeed. Choose somebody who has experience in a similar field, at least because this is relatively new territory. Um, don't go with somebody who can promise you the moon and somebody who's a local contractor who's done construction work on houses. This is specialized equipment and it needs a certain level of expertise. Have, I mean, most of the owners don't want to do everything by themselves. So have a good procurement strategy. If you're buying turnkey solutions, try to find out what's under the hood and also understand what level of control you're willing to give up in order to buy such solutions make sure that it is designed to the correct codes and standards. Uh, this is a relatively new market and there are several players. Uh, understand what the design standards need to be. And choosing the right contractor will make all the difference when it comes to startup. If you choose a seasoned contractor who's done this these jobs before, that might help you get your plan started a month earlier and that can make all the difference in your project revenues. So what, what kind of technology is used to make RNG? We start with the digester, then there is pretreatment, remove the moisture, uh, also remove the hydrogen sulfide, do a quality check, any off-spec gas goes to the flare, then there is removing the carbon dioxide, which is the other main component of the gas, and the tail gas can be destructed or uh, vented to the atmosphere. Another quality check, here is your gatekeeper before you send it to the grid. Here is a lagoon type of digester or a plug flow digester, uh, different types of digesters that are used in these processes. And this is a gas upgrading system, a 3D model view of that. You can see the hydrogen sulfide tanks, removal tanks, and the membranes over here. And this is a picture of a flare. Here we are showing the an installed facility in Wisconsin with the feed compressor, the gas treatment, and the membranes. And this is the outside of the building with the hydrogen sulfide removal vessels and the VOC removal vessel. 
So how is the gas going to be transported? Are you going to transport the gas using an actual pipeline or does a virtual pipeline make sense? If the amount of gas you're producing is low and a virtual pipeline might make more sense in aggregating the renewable natural gas from different sites and injecting at one injection point. And here you can see the trailers that are used for transporting this as compressed natural gas. And again, to emphasize, please understand what the requirements are in terms of pipeline interconnection. If there are any hidden surprises, you don't want to know it at the very end. What are the provisions? So, in case your plant, in case they turn you off at the pipeline, how much RNG do you want to store on site? Or in case you have some sort of an equipment failure, how much RNG are you need, required to store on site? Think about that and also know that the threshold quantity of methane is about 10,000 pounds. So if you go about that, it puts you into PSM facility category. So don't be under, again, on the pipeline interconnection. Here is a map of all the interstate pipeline system in the US. We are not showing any of the interstate or the local delivery companies. Don't be under the assumption that um, EPA will approve the new interconnection. Sometimes um, you can expect some sort of delays during this registration process. So engage with the EPA early in the planning and design process so that you can avoid delays or even worse, probably having to add more equipment. So also don't be under the assumption that the local pipeline will be readily willing to work with you, engage with them also in a timely manner know where the where the nearest location to your pipeline is and think about if it makes sense to have if you're working with four different dairy farms and you're injecting into a pipeline does a virtual pipeline make more financial sense think about the gas quality and the safety and analytical equipment that is required to keep this uh, the transport of rng active Again, safety is not an option. Uh, recognize that you are dealing with dangerous gases. You have methane, you have hydrogen sulfide, there's carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide. So dealing with this uh, whole project requires a level of expertise and understanding and awareness also continuing the operations requires that level of expertise. Um, know that, I mean, I'm sure everybody knows that methane is flammable, so there is danger of fire or explosion, and you have to make sure that you conduct a preliminary hazard, process hazard analysis and or a hazard operations analysis during the course of the project and build safety into the design and have a safe operations plan in place. Like how are you going to do deal with confined space entry, lock or tag out? Uh, these are very familiar terms for somebody coming from the chemical world, but not so much. I see that there is a gap in knowledge on the dairy farm side because we are dealing with different plays over here. Um, but not knowing is never an excuse. So please bring yourself up to speed on these requirements. As we've discussed through the course of the webinar, there are several different roadblocks that can hamper your project. So in order to move the project from paper to reality, you need to make sure you are dealing with these roadblocks in a timely manner, communicating effectively, managing people's expectations. There can be permitting issues that vary from state to state. There can be delays in schedule due to permitting or 
equipment or construction and startup. So make sure that everybody on the team is communicating efficiently and effectively and dealing with the problems as they come. As somebody said, it's, uh, it's sheer will to deal with things and the agility of the team to understand the problems and react to those problems in a timely, fa timely fashion that attributes to the success of the project. Um, having, ensuring that you're meeting all the compliance requirements because these projects are based on monetization of those environmental attributes. So having a compliance partner who's going to help you get through those requirements and achieve the monetization of credits is also another key factor that needs to be addressed from early on. So the key takeaways from this webinar, I hope, are that, as we can see, making renewable natural gas from manure is a very lucrative business proposition. But understand what your appetite for risk is. Cut your losses, move quickly. Plan what you're going to do, and then work your plan. Don't compromise on safety or quality. Know your team. I mean, that's one of the very critical factors and communicate, that makes all the difference. These are some of the reference RNG projects from Bartlett and West. Our dairy farm projects are mostly based in Wisconsin. And thank you to our partners, Nafel and DMT for sharing their valuable insights. Questions? Thank you, Sharisha. At this point, we're going to open it up for Q&A. I have several questions already in the queue, and I'll get those to you here in just a second. I would ask for those of you on the call, if you have questions, please send those through the chat box. Um, we'll wait a couple minutes for questions to come in. And so I'll start here. Our first question is, does adding on-site combined heat and power providing higher efficiency and producing RNG affect the LCFS score? And if so, how? Uh, thank you, John, for your question. I do think it will definitely affect the LCFS score because the LCFS score is about the entire pathway. And so if I understand you correctly, you're going to use the RNG and have a CHP system on site. Is that right? Okay, because LCFS depends on the overall reduction in the amount of CO2 emissions. So you have to, uh, I'm, I'm thinking it might be a positive. So you have to do the analysis to in order to get the uh, results on the CI score. Depends on what you're starting with and things. Uh, it is a little bit more tricky. So I hope that answers your question. All right, another question. What is the scale required to justify the CAPEX of an RNG project considering a scenario where only RFS is used and a scenario where RFS and LCFS are used? Um, so I cannot answer about the scale off the top of my head because using depends on how uh, if you're in it for the long term and if depends on how much gas is uh, there to uh, being produced if it's a large volume of gas then you might be able to justify that just with the rfs but if on the smaller volumes of gas it is critical for the lcfs to be part of it in order to uh, make the project viable Thank you, Sharisha. Another question here, does a developer need to secure 100% financing before getting into the feedstock agreements? 
offtake agreements, working with the EPC on design permits, interconnection, is a feasibility study enough to talk to financiers about? Um, Akash, uh, you don't need to have 100% financing before getting into the agreements. Often you're working with them in parallel so that you have your financial on your team while you're working on these agreements and they know what stage you are in. So, yeah. Okay, I'll, we'll wait a couple more minutes for questions to come in. I do wanna thank you again for sharing your time with us today. Thank you, Sharisha, for sharing your expertise with us. Um, as a reminder, a recording will be available on our website at BartlettWest.com. Uh, we also encourage you to connect with Sharisha directly. Her contact information is provided there. And it looks like at this time there are not any further questions. So we'll go on and wrap up our webinar today. Have a great day and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Take care, everyone. Thank you.